terminal velocity. Sounds like a doozy. Indeed, it can be a difficult thing to understand mathematically. If I just flash a bunch of equations on the board, then that's not very helpful. But instead, if we look at the concept first, it becomes fairly easy to understand. Let's say we have an object falling. For simplicity's sake, we'll make it a ball. Because this is BCC, we'll make it a blue and gold ball. Okay, so this ball is in free fall. What forces are acting on it? Well, first, there's gravity. For now, we can assume that the gravitational force is constant, equals to the product of m and g, where m is the mass of the ball, and g is approximately 9.8 meters per second. Now, if we were in a vacuum, that would be it. For many simpler physics problems, you can assume that there's nothing else going on here. Just the one force, that's it. But this is AP physics, so we're throwing in something new. Air resistance. How strong is this resistance? It depends. In a fluid, such as air, depending on the velocity, it can be proportional to the velocity or the square of the velocity. It is also proportional to a number of constants, such as the density of the medium and the area of the object. For simplicity purposes, we'll sum these all up into one variable called k. Let's work with the more common situation, where resistance is proportional to the square of the velocity. Now we have two forces acting on the object, one constant, the other proportional to the ball's velocity. Let's drop our ball and see where this takes us. We release the ball from rest with zero initial velocity. The gravitational force is constant, so the force acting downwards is mg. There is no drag force upwards because the ball's velocity is equal to zero. So the situation can be summed up like this. A few seconds later, the ball has a significant velocity. Now there is an actual resistance force, meaning the force accelerating the ball downwards is not zero, but it's not as big as it was previously. Assigning down as the positive direction, we can describe the net force mathematically as the gravitational force minus the resistance force. Let's say we drop the ball from a fairly large height, maybe off the Empire State Building or something. It's been falling for a while and the velocity has gotten large, large enough that the drag resistance force is now equal or nearly equal to the gravitational force. In such a situation, the net force is zero. Because no net force is acting on the ball, by Newton's first law, the ball will continue to fall at a constant speed. This speed is called the terminal velocity. If we rearrange the variables from our equation, we can find a formula to calculate the value of terminal velocity, which leaves us with v equals the square root of mg over k. This is the terminal velocity of an object falling straight downwards in air. Now, what can we predict and explain using this equation? Well, first of all, notice how the velocity is proportional to, among other things, mass. This explains why light and heavy objects accelerate at the same speed, but heavy objects can fall faster. Unlike gravity, the resistance force is not proportional to mass, and thus the resulting acceleration, or deceleration if you prefer, is smaller for more massive objects by Newton's second law. Another thing we can predict with this equation is the velocity of the ball as a function of time. Unfortunately, doing so when the resistance force is proportional to the velocity squared involves a number of calculus techniques and a complicated answer that I would rather not show or derive on this video. Instead, I'll work with an easier equation, where resistance is directly proportional to velocity. It shows the same concept, but is much more practical for the purposes of this video, and gives you an example of the kind of differential equations you usually do in AP Physics. First, start with Newton's second law. Sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. This can also be written as mass times the derivative of velocity with respect to time, or dv dt. In this case, the sum of the forces is equal to the gravitational force minus the resistance force, kv. Recall that we are using kv instead of kv squared just to make things easy. If we combine the two equations, we have our differential equation. As it is, we aren't ready to integrate. Let's manipulate the variables a bit. First, we isolate dv dt and rearrange the variables in a way that will allow v to be the value subtracted from once the variables are separated. For purposes of convenience, the value mg over k will be represented by a capital letter C. This value mg over k is also equal to the terminal velocity of the object when the resistance source is directly proportional to the velocity of the object, times k, of course. Next, we separate the variables with the term containing v on the same side as the dv and the other terms on the side of dt. 
Next, both sides are integrated from the initial values of each variable, and time and velocity both start at zero, to the final value, an arbitrary time t and velocity v. We evaluate the integral and simplify the logarithm so we can exponentiate a single value. We then exponentiate both sides in order to get rid of the logarithm. Simplifying, we are able to obtain a form with only v on one side, and remembering that c is equal to mg over k, we are able to rewrite the equation as v equals mg times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m all over k, or as the terminal velocity times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, it means that the terminal velocity isn't ever actually reached, at least under perfect conditions. Rather, the acceleration becomes smaller and smaller as time goes on, eventually approaching zero as time approaches infinity. The velocity thus asymptotically approaches a single value, the terminal velocity. While this equation doesn't represent most falling objects, that would be the complicated equation involving resistance proportional to velocity squared, it gives you a good idea of how the mechanics of terminal velocity work. For example, objects with larger surface areas approach their terminal velocities faster, and more massive objects approach terminal velocity slower. Well, I hope this presentation was succinct enough. Not particularly creative, I would have preferred to use software like that which Sal Khan uses for his videos, but for something done on MS Paint, Word, and Windows Movie Maker, I think this is a pretty effective presentation of the concept of terminal velocity.